So hello everybody, I'm Marco Crepaldi from uh, the Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia from here, uh, from here in Torino and my talk today will regard our research activities related to impulse radio ultra wideband technology in IIT. So basically what I want to say today is, is uh, to introduce today is uh, basically our achievement in the design and the implementation of uh, wireless system based on impulse radio ultra wideband and to uh, to let's say to give an introduction on this technology so basically we are talking about internet of things today this morning we have seen a lot of interesting presentation re presentations regarding all the different sub modules that can be used for internet of things this is just a definition of course uh, we can interpret uh, many many possible definitions for the internet of things but of course how um, we learned today uh, energy budget is the main limiting factor that uh, targets a specific application regarding Internet of Things. So basically, as uh, we could understand today, there is a growing interest also from research to provide new solutions for, uh, let's say, the uh, wireless transmission of data for the Internet of Things. So basically, my talk uh, and the wireless technology we are using here is Impulse Radio Ultra Wideband. Impulse radio ultra wideband is a subclass of e ultra wideband, where ultra wideband is being defined in 2002 by the FCC, with for an unlicensed uh, communication, and we have two bands, 0 960 megahertz or 3.1 to 10.6 gigahertz. In particular, they released the 3.1 10.6 gigahertz, and with a PSD of minus 41.3 dBm per megahertz which is pretty low compared to the other wireless technologies that are op already operating in the spectrum. Of course, the main idea is to reallocate some spectrum for the UWB usage, but of course, to fulfill a huge bandwidth like UWB, there are several ways. Uh, the first way is to use OFDM approaches. For example, if you refer to Y Media approaches, something like that, uh, the wireless USB. Or we can use pulses impulses, so something that covers a very large bandwidth and that it has a very short duration, okay? So basically the scenario for maybe an Internet of Things, so we, we considered this morning a lot of interesting presentation regarding that. And of course, if we need to, to go to the Internet, we need to, to achieve some kind of standard. So maybe we have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth transceivers that can uh, uh, enable, let's say, the connection of uh, classes of sensors to the internet, but also we can have many smaller nodes that can be non-standardized, for example ERUWB, even though there are standards regarding ERUWB, that can be bridged to nodes which include both ERUWB transceivers and standard transceivers. Why? Because with UWB we can achieve very low power consumption, ultra low power consumption. Okay, so basically I'm referring in this talk, what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, we have some kind of TCP, IP or socket based communication with some very intelligent and large nodes that can communicate one to the other with wake up and duty cycling mechanisms. But then we have some kind of, let's say, non-standard IRUWB systems, which, which can um, take advantage of different modulation formats different spike based communication like Danilo said before so something which is related to exactly the time domain use of spikes okay we're talking about pulse repetition frequency modulation we're talking about uh, self-synchronized modulations we're talking about any kind of modulation you may invent depending also on the channel conditions maybe you can put some processing gain or at the receiver or maybe you can encode data using more pulses or other uh, less pulses then you can bridge everything to some kind of intelligent smart node to go to the TCP IP or to uh, make a TCP IP based or socket communication so basically what I want to give uh, is an introduction on the integrated chipsets we have and the different approaches we use for Impulse Radio and then some example applications, okay? When I talk about integrated chipset, I, I also talk about the IPs and when I talk uh, about IPs, of course, I'm referring to a range of power consumption of 0 0.01 to 10 milliwatts. So of course we are not uh, we are we are covering a broad range of things based on the sensitivity of the systems and stuff like that 
So basically we have two approaches. We design impulse radio ultra wideband systems that operates in the high bands, which are basically, basically non-coherent energy detection and they are event driven. So basically the front end plus the base band are optimized so that they can uh, receive a pulse and generate a digital event. The digital event can go to an FPGA or some kind of very low power digital logic, because FPGA is not very low power, but of course it depends on the application, uh, to compute, the day, to compute, let's say, the, the delays between the pulses and extract digital data. On the other hand, since we have seen this morning that asynchronous design is dominating the scene for the implementation of digital, let's say, control units for internet, the Internet of Things, for example, what we, wa what we did here is to design some all digital impulse radio ultra wideband transceivers based completely on logic gates, uh, having a good compromise in terms of sensitivity and power consumption compared to analog solutions, but these are modular and, uh, let's say, scalable. So this is an example for high moderate low data rate transmitter. This is, looks big, but then in the end has an area of 0.007 millimeter square. So more or less is the same size of a pad for signal IO on a 130 nanometers IC. And uh, this guy can generate pulses from 0.3 to 4.4 gigahertz. So this is an example of very low complexity implementation. And of course, this is asynchronous. What does it mean? It means that sucks 10 nanowatt power or even less, then it depends on the supply voltage we, we may need. And then it uh, consumes, uh, let's say, 30 picojoule per radiated pulse at 4.4 gigahertz. So it's something that can be completely asynchronously triggered, okay? This is an example of our receiver we, we have. So this is to, it has been developed to counterbalance uh, narrowband interference. And when I talk about narrowband interference, I'm, I'm talking about some, something that can be 30 dB or even more um, compared to the UWB signal, to the average power of the UWB signal that gets in the, the receiver. And basically is a revisitation of an envelope detector plus some kind of analog signal, uh, analog control logic, let's say at the baseband, so that we can reject uh, the uh, slow envelope variation compared to pulses. When I say impulse radio, I always say something that lasts one nanosecond, let's say, and has a bandwidth of mo more than 500 megahertz. So that's the official definition of, of UWB. Bandwidth bigger than 500 megahertz in the high band or a fractional bandwidth zero of at least 0 0.2 in the low and the high band. But of course, we're talking about something that more or less has a duration of one nanosecond, okay? So this is an example, SO key, as you could see here, okay, is, um, is a kind of self-synchronized modulation in which we encode two pulses as a one and one pulses as a zero. And this can has the advantage that can be recovered at the receiver even without a precise clock. Because of course all these kind of things self-synchronized and are good because then you don't you don't need a crystal. Okay? So this is an example operation of this kind of receiver. Of course, you can see from this simulation that RFN is corrupted by narrowband interference and then uh, the output of the baseband toggles when you have some kind of pulses. Of course, the latency is increased to 100 nanosecond compared to 1 nanosecond duration pulses, but then for moderate and low data rate application, this is not an issue. Of course, for high data rate, what we achieved now for a project, uh, which is called, uh, I mean, it's a cyberbrain project we have with IIT, is to design a high data rate receiver as well. But of course, since now has not been investigated much, we, we implemented an envelope detector high data rate receiver with some kind of compression control, just to have 100 to 150 mega pulses per second. Of course, this is an envelope detection receiver as well and has some power consumption of, let's say, 10, 10 milliwatts. And basically what we do here is to do some kind of down conversion of the pulses without using a mixer and an IQ demodulation, of course, down conversion, but we use an envelope detector. If when you use the envelope detector, we emphasize some components by using some kind of, let's say, compression control that is using audio signals to limit the noise dynamic range. So basically we could put some kind of decompression, which is kindly similar to let's say energy detection, but this is not an energy detector, this is something that goes to the sixth power. So it's, it's kind of different. 
Then for all digital impulse radio, so now I'm talking about the Z960 MHz bands, what we do is, what, you want, what we achieved here is a receiver that can be scaled to different technology nodes by using a modular approach, okay? So basically we use standard cells, asynchronous standard cells, but we're not using a, let's say, handshake mechanism, some kind of delay insensitive device, some kind of delay insensitive design. What we do is to put asynchronous logic and let the analog signal be converted into digital domain using the difference between edges and, gen and then feed some asynchronous logic that statistically works as the analog. So basically, we don't want to achieve a perfect cause-effect relationship between the edges and the signal that goes out, of course, but we target some kind of average and statistical operation of the receiver. So basically, this is, a, this is an example receiver. Of course, we are working on that. At the front end, we have inverter-based amplifier, and then the detection is based on an FSK demodulation because, uh, as you might see here, this delta T can be a frequency modulation detector. Of course, we are not talking about modulation here; we, we're talking about keying. So it's a frequency shift keying because we send digital data. But of course, this has not mo a, di ma a big difference compared to an FM detector. And of course, all this system is is like a, conti a continuous type state machine whose clock is the RF wave, okay? So based on the events of the RF waves, this guy evolves toward a state that can be the reception of a bit or not, okay? This is what we have inside. I cannot go in more details on that, but b basically uh, we use just logic gates. And what we achieve is 40 microwatt for minus 66 dBm sensitivity at 450 megahertz, which is more or less the same frequency that is used. Uh, it's near to the uh, ISM 433 megahertz, but indeed, this frequency is more or less around the maximum point where the maximum tissue penetration is possible in humans. So this radio can be, for example, used for biomedical application, for example. And it has a very low power consumption. Of course, you can consider this as a wake-up receiver as well because the sensitivity is not that high. But of course, uh, the power consumption is very low. Okay? Of course, there is a counterpart, which is an all-digital impulse radio TX. And of course, using the same... Uh, uh, technique to design asynchronously digital circuits, which not necessarily the same used for microprocessors. What we can achieve a very low complexity DLL, uh, PLL, and with this PLL we can uh, synthesize pulses using just one single reference. Of course, this is pulse radio, of course, uh, and it operates in the low bands. So this is the TX, which is related to the same RX that I was presenting you before. So now. This is more or less an introduction on the spectrum of the research uh, on circuit design and uh, IC, uh, ICs on impulse radial to wideband we did till now. But of course, what I want to introduce you is some kind of applications. Of course, I'm not going to talk about human brain interfaces because um, we don't have enough time. Of course, this is another project I was talking about before. But uh, what I can give you is, is to give an introduction on, let's say, the possibilities we can have with EWB. Of course, from the presentation of today, we might have noticed that what they, we, we want to achieve for the RF design of the future is to mix the different levels, physical, medium access control and networking levels, so that we can do some, let's say, interlayer Aussie stack uh, um, communication between the physical layer and the application level. And of course, what uh, I'm going to do here with this is just use pulses freedomly as if we are in a human body. So b the biological approach here is applied to the pulses and use pulse triggers to encode information. Some example, biosignal transmission. Of course, the wireless transmission of force can be very valuable for, um, let's say, hand exoskeletons or for, let's say, um, uh, application that, re that, re that relates to the contraction of muscles and uh, to the feedback and control, for example. Of course, if you want to transmit data using a standard radio, you have to sample the data, packetize the data, put some overhead for the preamble, for the, PS, uh, for the synchronization header, blah, 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 and then send a very long packet. Then more or less, I, I, I don't know, I can say something 40% of data compared to a 
a complete packet duration, okay? So you have a lot of overhead. Of course, what we do here, we don't want to transmit all the data possible uh, to, for the MG signal because we want just to transmit the wireless inform the information wirelessly the information of force. And if you want to transmit wirelessly force information, we have demonstrated that you can we can um, consider a let's say an event-based representation of EMG signals. This is a sweep force of my uh, let's say left arm of the EMG signal here. You apply a threshold, and of course you obtain firing pulses. These pulses can be asynchronously radiated using impulse radio ultra wide bands. Of course, this is not a standard communication at all because this is something. It's like the the same firing you have in the muscle, which is radiated over the air, of course. But of course, if you consider a bandwidth of 500 megahertz and the FCC rules, considering the repetition frequencies that are involved, then you are fine. You can transmit this. And basically, we have demonstrated that this approach, with this approach, you can send wirelessly force information using, um, uh, let's say, more or less 100 times less pulses, and even more, but it can depend on the firing you have on the muscles, compared to a packet-based communication. So, by using the continuous time delay between one pulse and another, you can encode very efficiently information, in this case wireless force, and obtain at the receiver 92% correlation. This is an example. These are two prototypes. The first prototype is, uh, has been uh, developed in IIT two years ago, and this is just the first demonstrator with big modules. Now we are aiming at shrinking down the modules and obtain some kind of very small node so that we can use directly the muscle force and radiate the pulse wirelessly. Of course, you may say, okay, but this is just a single channel. You just put a threshold and you radiate pulses. Of course, we can radiate single pulses if you need one channel. Or if you need more channel, you can associate to the firing a specific pattern with an address. And this goes as we, we will see later with Paolo, to the address event representation, and which, which is a very good paradigm used in neuromorphic approaches. Okay? Basically, the ATC approach has some problem, and this is another example. What we can do is to improve the ATC and put some digital logic that can track the threshold that it can apply to the MG signal to efficiently radiate the pulses. Of course, the average number of pulses we we, we use with this is much larger, is larger, not much, larger compared to ATC because then we track the, let's say, envelope of the EMG signal using a threshold, but of course, still, it is low compared to a packet-based communication. Now, second thing, hardware in the loop. We have a flexible and asynchronous UWB transceiver. We need to, some, to, do, to have some kind of channel estimation you have seen uh, this morning that we, can, we need to estimate the RF signal that gets into the receiver, okay? What we can do is to make two custom PCBs that, you know, can be connected to an hardware, an hardware that can be a PC, a PC that is running a VHDL code We are you are designing with some kind of commercial tool. Then you can apply directly using this hardware in the loop design, direct, directly the transmitter and the receiver using a specific band to consider the channel impairment in the design of the digital logic. So this is an hardware in the loop. Basically, this is the, let's say, w one idea that we had. Uh, and it's normally hardware in the loop is applied for, um, for uh, um, let's say, mechanical design, for example, in trains, uh, or you have feedback frequencies uh, or something like 100 hertz or stuff like that. But here, you can think of you putting the channel directly in your design without requiring a model. You sample it from a reality, let's say, and you go back and you put it in your PC, and in your PC you can design directly the hardware using the direct signals that come from the channel without having to generate a test bench and you put in the loop the hardware directly, okay? This it means that you can consider a standard hardware input in your VHDL description, and this is only due to the fact that the UWB channel is asynchronously driven, okay? We don't, use a, we don't rely on the use of precise crystals, we just let the, you know, the, the pulses go through the channel, and the information is the delay, so, who generates this trigger, uh, event trigger, has the, the ability to 
uh, decide which kind of modulation, pass based, we're going to use. This is an example that tells us that if you consider this hardware in the loop design, you put it in a standard uh, design flow, what you have is that the simulation time you, you want to, or maybe the verification time you need to build something can be drastically reduced. Of course, this needs to have, if you want to target different bands, a very flexible ERUWB trans transmitter and receiver. But of course, if you use the same chipset, then depending on the application, you may think of designing, uh, let's say, the modulation and the number of pulses that you might require to repeat doing a transmission based on the channel conditions, as we have seen this morning with the, with the presentation. So I have to be quick. So this is another example, audio signal streaming. This is not digital, this is analog radio. It's like an FM radio, but it's pulse-based. So basically we use a VCO that triggers the generation of pulses, and the pulses can be generated here. So you see it's a continuous time modulation, it's not digital. And basically what we did here, so this is just a video, I don't think you'll be able to, to hear the audio, but just to show you the operating distance of about 1 meter, 2.5 meters. And what we achieved here is using is a system that can transmit wirelessly a good signal which is comparable to FM radio at a higher signal to noise ratio of 70 dB using uh, f uh, with batteries of 100 milliamps hour uh, that last 50 hours at the transmitter and 12 hours at the receiver. So this is done with commercial with the, our chipsets. You can see here, this is our chip, with some kind of standard components we used. Of course, if you go to an ASIC design, you can do much better, and this is what we want to do. Last, source distance estimation. Uh, it is known that one of the best, uh, um, so, uh, let's say, uh, application domains of impulse radio ultra wideband is distance es estimation, ranging, let's say the computation of the time of flight between a transmitter and a receiver because pulses has a very uh, high time resolution and you can, let's say, compute the distance with the speed of, uh, starting by the speed of light. But here we want to achieve low complexity implementation. So for some kind of application where the radiated field can be confined with some antennas and the distance is given, then you can think of using, reusing, let's say the latency of receivers, so a received signal strength indication, which is not at protocol level here, but it's physical level only. In other words, the receiver latency changes according to the signal level that goes in. And achieve some kind of short distance estimation with a sensitivity here, one 11 nanoseconds and two centimeters. We are not uh, violating the speed of light rule, of course, uh, but this is just the latency of the system. But we want to demonstrate with this. We demonstrated with this uh, system is that uh, we, with the latency, we can uh, have a much more sens much more yeah sensitivity compared to speed of light uh, computation um, for short distances. So. Uh, I, I'm sorry, but I, I, I need to be quick. So I conclude this talk. I gave you an introduction on the, some kind of bio-inspired uh, design for you the impulse radio ultra wideband systems. And uh, my message here is that even these are difficult to be implemented as standard, of course. Some companies are coming out with, uh, with the standardized products now. But uh, that can be used in low-end bridging uh, of wireless sensor networks because the power consumption is very limited, and then we can be flexible using this time domain approach, so this firing only when required, so that we can achieve energy, very low energy consumption. And of course, a flexible solution if you consider the radio from this point of view. Of course, this is a cross-sectional view that may, let's say, hinder some other aspects of UWB, but of course, this is, uh, uh, let's say, our research target we want to achieve for short distance communication. So, thank you very much for your attention.